Hello and welcome along to this week's edition of the show. If you're new here to the YouTube channel of Unbelievable, then do make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to get more of this content. You can even subscribe to our newsletter as well. There's a link with the info from today's video. Today on the show, we're talking about ancient wisdom and the meaning crisis. My guests are John Viveki and Sorab Amari. Now, the West is experiencing a meaning crisis, according to John Viveki. He's a cognitive science and psychology professor at the University of Toronto. And he says this meaning crisis has been accompanied by a mental health crisis, often tied to our consumption of social media and the online world. Now, John is not a conventionally religious believer, but says religious practice and community may hold the key to awakening from the meaning crisis in our modern age. Uh, We'll hear about his lecture series, I'm sure, awakening from the meaning crisis during the course of the show as well. Uh, Sorab Amari is an Iranian born journalist and author who converted as an adult from atheism to Roman Catholicism. And his new book, The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos, seeks to draw on lots of stories of numerous figures down the ages, arguing that a technologically advanced yet culturally shallow age needs to return to the wisdom of our forebears to find its way forward. So welcome along to the programme, John and Sorab. It's great to have you both with me. Um, John, let's let's hear from you, first of all, uh, new to the show. Well, both new to the show, though I have had the opportunity to, to interview Sorab on a, on a previous occasion. Um, uh, t- tell us a bit about your background, John, and, and how long you've been doing this, and especially, you know, cognitive science and psychology. That's been your thing for quite a while now, hasn't it? Yeah, I, uh, I thank you for uh, welcoming me onto me onto the show, and it's a pleasure to meet you, Sarah. Um Yeah, uh, I've been teaching at the University of Toronto uh, since 1994. Um, I recently uh, got tenure, um, and um, so I'm 60% in psychology, where I teach cognitive psychology, and I put a lot of emphasis on things like thinking, reasoning, problem solving, insight, meaning making mindfulness creativity rationality wisdom those are all my the areas i do a lot of work on and then um i'm 40 percent in cognitive science i'm also the director of the cognitive science program at the university of toronto uh where i do a lot of work on uh a process uh processes a process i call relevance realization its connections to intelligence sense making and consciousness altered states of consciousness um and so that, that's sort of what i do um, the reason why I got involved in this whole, I don't know what to call it, this arena that we're, <laughs> we're, we're all sort of finding ourselves in, is um, I was a, a, a colleague of mine, he, he's no longer a colleague, he's now moved to the University of British Columbia, but uh, Evan Thompson, one of the founding figures of what's called 4E Cognitive Science, and perhaps I'll get to that at some point, uh, he was supposed to teach a course called Buddhism and Cognitive Science, and he couldn't teach it. And he said, hey, John would be a good person to teach that course. So I started teaching that course. Um, and then uh, and I, I teach related courses on the psychology of wisdom. Like I said, courses on mindfulness. Um, and the course became very popular. And, and then I recorded a really crappy version of it on my home computer kind of thing. And I loaded it up to YouTube. And there was an interest in it. And then I had a, stu- a former student come to me. And he had uh, professional skills at... Uh, you know, recording and editing, and his dad is a professional editor, and they said, no, let's do this, and let's do it really well. Um, and that's, uh, so I took uh, that course, I took the course on the psychology of wisdom, the course on relevance realization, the work I've done on altered states of consciousness, mystical experiences, all that, and I, I integrated it together. Um, mm-hmm. Because what I, what I was seeing in the course is, um, <laughs> And sometimes we're lucky, right? Sometimes we're lucky. Uh, a problem that I had sort of been wrestling with in my own personal life, I, I started sort of exploring if other people were talking about this. And then as I started to build an argument about the nature of meaning, meaning in life, um, and, and the meaning crisis, the students were just like uh, getting so, you know, engrossed in the material. And, mm. um, and, and so I thought when, when, my student, Alan, came to me, my former student, and said, let's, let's put this on YouTube. I thought, okay. I was, I was, I was actually, like, I was worried about it. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult going from lecturing in front of 
you know, a live audience to lecturing to an empty camera kind of thing and mm. what yeah. that would be like for me. And I'm sort of socially phobic by nature. And I remember the first three months that w uh, when I released the series, I would wake up at 3 a.m. feeling terrifically exposed kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, but as I got into it, I started to meet, you know, more and more people um, that were talking about it, interested in it, and just tremendous amount of convergence around it. And so that's how I find myself here now. Yeah. I mean, I, I listened to your recent conversation with Jordan Peterson, a fellow Canadian psychologist, also, you know, at the University yep. of Toronto. Yep. Um, Co colleague of mine, yes. You, you've known him longer than most of us, obviously. Um, Yes. I mean, what's what's the overlap with with yourself and what Jordan Peterson? In a sense, he's become a f phenomenon in his own right. What what's the overlap with your work and his? Well, before he he skyrocketed into it, into godhood, um, he uh, <laughs> he and I had a uh, we had we had a lot of overlapping students. Uh, we have overlapping concerns. He is. Uh, I mean, uh, we have different concerns, but the areas where we overlap is we're both very interested in this issue around. Uh, the meaning crisis. Um, we're very interested in, I, I find these terms inadequate, but we're very interested in religion, spirituality, transformative processes, um, altered states of consciousness, uh, transformation of character, cultivation of wisdom. We're also, we have also overlapping interests on the more, you, I guess you might call it the scientific side. He and I have overlapping interests around this thing. I talk about relevance, realization. He talks about it too, the, what's known as the frame problem in cognitive science. Uh, we actually had a public debate on that. Uh, it was the first time we debated and discussed. Unfortunately, it wasn't recorded, uh, so uh, it's lost. Uh, but um, so uh, at many levels, in many ways, uh, we have overlapping interests. We often shared students. We were often at conferences together, on panels yeah. together. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a remarkable conversation that you have with him. I mean, I... Jordan Peterson was, let me put it this way, lively. <laughs> he was, you, you barely managed to get yeah. a thought out before he had another kind of thought popping in um, during that interview. So it was, a, it was a fun one to listen to. But um, I'll come back to you in a moment because I want you to define what you mean by this meaning crisis in a moment, John. Mm -hmm. Let's introduce mm -hmm. our other guest, Sorab Amari. Um, Sorab, tell us a bit about your, your story, your background, before you tell us about the book. Um, you, were, you grew up in Iran initially, but didn't embrace the Islamic revolution there. What What is your story when it comes to, to faith? Um, sure. Um, I, um, as you said, I was born and raised in Tehran, Iran. I moved to the U.S. when I was um, 13, about to turn uh, 14. Um, but already before I left Iran, I had declared myself an atheist because I just associated God with the God of the Ayatollahs and their you know judicial floggings and amputations and so forth. Um, and then came to the United States, more or less took a path that isn't that exotic. I mean, I, I wrote a spiritual memoir before the current book about my decision to become a Roman Catholic. And, um, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not too exotic for a 16 year old to read Thus Spoke Zarathustra and read Nietzsche and think that he's the first one after Nietzsche to hit upon the idea that there may be no God and, Therefore, human beings don't have creatureliness, and therefore, uh, human nature or nature as such has no norm, and therefore, you can remake the world as you please, um, whether in a kind of nihil in, a, in a kind of nihilistic direction or, as I in my case, you know, briefly becoming a kind of Marxist um, radical, and then through a long process of um, of, of reading, um, I came to believe, first of all, in a God and then in a personal God and ultimately in the God of the Bible, as I encountered him in, um, in the Catholic Church. The hardest was to just to come to believe in a, in a, a personal God. Um, and um, in the, my particular path, I don't, I don't think we talked about this in our previous conversation, Justin, but my path to coming to believe that there is a God is is the one that C.S. Lewis recommends, as it were, in his mere Christianity, although I hadn't encountered it at the time. Um, and in some ways, Immanuel Kant as well. And that's the um, proof by way of the conscience. That is that there seems to be some interior voice that we all have that urges us to eschew evil and to do good. And that interior voice 
tends to mirror what seems to be kind of an objective order among all peoples. I mean, there are differences at the margins, but all peoples, you know, um, revile theft and, and, and murder and rape. And, um, uh, uh, and so there's, there seems to be some objective moral order in the world and that in its, and its dictates, uh, mirror or reflect, you know, the conscience as we experience it, the moral conscience. And mm. to me, ultimately, that came to be, uh, you know, proof for the existence of a God, because um, if there is a moral order, then it has an, has an author, and there seems to be um, this order around me, both a moral order and a natural order, that couldn't be accounted for, for otherwise. And I, I would grant, you know, the kind of, um, you know, Richard Dawkins of the world and others that... Um, you know, that voice that I hear and call the conscience is a product of thousands of years of, you know, evolutionary development in our species, or that it's, you know, millions of synapses firing in the brain. I, I would grant all of those as answers to empirical how questions, but I, I couldn't grant them that they answer um, why questions, which are questions of, of metaphysics, of philosophy, and also of, of of theology proper of revelation, um, and that the two needn't be in tension with each other. And you can you can um, grant that um, the that uh, empirical science answers the how questions, but it fails because it's not designed to answer ultimate questions, uh, which are really it is the domain of uh, domain of uh, philosophy and theology. So that and, and, and to make a long answer for this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, C.S. Lewis obviously uh, features as one of the thinkers in the book, and we'll come to the book later. But and and feel free to weave, uh, you know, as we go through the conversation with John, any more that that kind of you know is relevant from your own story as well uh, as we go. But I wondered, um, John, we've titled this discussion "Ancient Wisdom," drawing on the title of uh, Sorab's book uh, and the Meaning Crisis, which is really what has defined a lot of your work in recent years. So what would you, in a nutshell, describe the meaning crisis as? Um, where did it come from? And what do you think we should do about it? Well, I, I, the, 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 the title is actually very uh, appropriate. So I'm looking forward to this discussion because I think there's deep, uh, deep connections uh, between the topic of wisdom and the topic of meaning in life. Uh, very deep and I think profound um, and important. Uh, so I, I actually often introduce the meaning crisis uh, via the topic of wisdom. So let me try that because I think it might also uh, give us some initial common ground that we can connect up on. So here's here's an idea. Um, I'm going to take it for granted that people will uh, grant me good faith that most of my claims are backed up by extensive argument and evidence <laughs> elsewhere that I've uh, put out because I mean my series is 50 hours long and sure, I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to <laughs> right. Let me do the whole argument right now. Uh, that's not going to happen. Um, so. The basic idea uh, is, uh, uh, the, you know, the, that uh, cognition, the very processes that make us a cognitive agent, uh, they're, di they're dynamically self-organizing processes. Uh, we, can, we can get a little bit more into what that means, but basically you can think of that you, there's a loop between you and the world, and what you're doing is you're shaping that loop in various ways uh, in order to zero in on the relevant information and ignore the irrelevant information. This, by the way, turns out to be, uh, I've argued extensively with other people, by the way, uh, um, that this, I think, is the core of our general intelligence. It's the ability that we're finding very, very difficult to give to, our, uh, to AI, to make it into, gener into, into genuine artificial general intelligence. Mm. So this... So when I'm talking about uh, meaning, I don't want you to, I mean, it's a metaphor. We're using the, the, like what a sentence has. That's a proposition, right? And the way a sentence coheres together and links us in the world. I want you to think of it, and, and this is how we talk about it when, in psychology when we talk about meaning in life. I want to talk, mean, uh, I want to mean more how you're making sense of things. What's standing out for you? What's backgrounded for you? What aspect you're seeing me under? What identity you're assuming in correspondence? That's what I'm talking about that whole machinery by which your cognitive agency is shaping you so that you can be what we are. We're general problem solvers. We can solve a wide variety of problems in a wide variety of domains. And so this process is dynamic. It's self-organizing. And what it's doing is, and this sounds almost like a Zen Cohen, 
It's it's making you intelligent by having you ignore most of the information in your environment. Because it, you can't do this. You can't check it all, and all the information, by the way, in your long-term memory, and see if it's relevant. It, it, that's that's combinatorial explosive. No machine, no supercomputer could even approximate uh, that. Uh, so what you do is you're doing what you're doing right now. You're probably focusing on me and my face, and you weren't thinking about your left big toe until I said <laughs> your left big toe, yes. for example, right? <laughs> but if it started hurting, then you would shift your attention. Now, that is like, again, I'm just going to have to go, hope that people will take me on good faith. That is like the core ability. And notice how it's a, it's a living connection. I'm not talking about you know, grasping a proposition. I'm talking about the way you are in a living dynamic connection with your environment. Now, it's the core of what makes you intelligent. The problem with it is the very thing that makes you intelligent makes you susceptible to self-deception. So, right, L let me give you an example, a concrete example. If I were to play chess and I tried to calculate all the possible sequences of movements, I couldn't do it. No, not even the fastest computers do it that way. So what do we do? We, we, we tend to focus. We focus on the center board. We focus on our king. But we can still lose. I, I beat somebody not that long ago because I noticed that they were focusing on the center board and their king. And I played a peripheral game where, where I p pretended to be threatening their king and then I knocked out their queen and etc. Right? Do you see what I mean? Right? And so you're constantly, you're, so these are all of our cognitive biases. We have all of these ways of focusing our attention. And when it focuses, we say, oh, that's intelligent. But when, when it biases our attention, it's the very same process, but we say, oh, it biased our attention. So, for example, uh, you know, you can take a look, in the, uh, uh, just as one example, people tend to only look for information that confirms a belief they're testing. This, this, and this just feeds into the echo chambering in social media. Okay, now, I, I'll, I'll get there very shortly. Uh, st thank okay. you for sticking with me. Okay, so cultures, across cultures and across history, people have have figured out this perennial problem of self-deception, self-destructive, other destructive, self-deceptive behavior. And what they've done is they've created ecologies of practices. Because this is a complex dynamical system, you can't just intervene on it by, oh, I'll just start believing this, or, you know, well, yeah, do it sometime. Just that, you know, if, 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 if that's all it was, we wouldn't need to go to therapy. You know, just stop doing that. That doesn't work, right? <laughs> And so we need very complex ecologies of practices in order to deal with that self-deceptive behavior. And then they need to be situated within, uh, you know, a valorizing worldview. When you have that, when you have an ecology of practices that's designed to ameliorate that foolishness, that self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior, and enhance that connectedness, that meaning in life, right? So to really try and shift so we get a much more of the connectedness and much less of the self-deceptive across in that domain general manner. And that is situated within a tradition and a community that valorizes it with a supportive worldview. That's wisdom. And here's the issue. For various reasons, historical, mostly that I go in this series, our philosophical and cultural history, what has happened is we have lost a worldview that has a proper place and valorizes an ecology of practices for the cultivation of wisdom and the enhancement of meaning. So the predominant worldview is the scientific worldview. And as a cognitive scientist, this is the problem I, I take as my central task in cognitive science. The scientific worldview has an explanation of everything but how science is possible. So it's got this wonderful explanation of atoms and solar systems and galaxies mm. and even living things and blah, 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 blah. But what about, uh, what about the act of doing science? How do we make that meaning? How do we, because science is a process. We shouldn't confuse science with its claims. Science is a massive ecology of practices for overcoming self-deception. That's what the scientific method, I think, is properly understood. How is it, how, how is it that we are able to do this? We, it, to speak of it pictorially, we have this scientific worldview in which we, as meaning makers and as the generators of science, do not have any proper place or home. And so what you're seeing uh, and what you've been seeing over time, I, I think it sort of starts in around the 11th century. Um, what you're seeing over time is people increasingly feeling 
you know, disconnected from each other, from the world, uh, um, from themselves even. Uh, and so you get a whole bunch of symptoms. We've got the, the rise in uh, suicide, even suicide independent of clinical depression right now, which is a very, mm-hmm. well, that's a very telling mm-hmm. sign. Loneliness epidemic, it's just, right? We have the mental health crisis, which I, most people are now acknowledging, depression, anxiety disorders. We have, we have the, 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 the addiction crises, the opioid crises. We, we have the virtual exodus, people now explicitly declaring that they prefer to live in the virtual world rather than in the real world. And I think that, that mm-hmm. tells you what, they're finding something in that world that's missing from the real world. Mm. Um, but you also have what I would, my, I, what Christopher Pietro and I call sort of positive responses. You have the mindfulness revolution. You have uh, the, 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 the revival and growth of, you know, Hellenistic wisdom philosophies like Stoicism, uh, the, 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 you know, what, what motivated my original series, the attempts by the West, and it's not going great to try and import Buddhism into mm. uh, Western uh, society. So, you, and, and there's a bunch of other things, you, like I, I'm talking too long, but, but, but there's a whole, I've tried to give you the, the explanation of the symptomology. It, it, it's, a, it's really helpful and, and I think gives us the big picture in a really helpful way and obviously brings it right up to date in a sense with the way I think, you know, social media and everything has accelerated that and technology yeah. has accelerated yes. that, that alienation almost from other people in a, in a sort of strange way, even though we're more connected than ever before, we're, we're less connected at another level. Um, so Rab, um, yeah. just briefly, how do you think your book connects to this? I mean, just, just to give a very brief summary of it, the unbroken thread, I think was essentially written to your young son, Max, and, and is really a kind of a book that you're hoping he'll read when he comes of the right age to sort of say, here are some examples of what I think are great ways to live in the world and to live wisely in the world and you 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 give the examples of numerous people down the ages and their their thinking and philosophy um and you start the story with the the namesake of your son um the the catholic saint maximilian colbe um maybe to start with that story and, and how it ties into the book and, and then we'll start talking about its its relevance to, to what john's been talking about sure um i'll try to start with maximilian colbe and then jump into C.S. Lewis a little bit because the, cha- the Lewis chapter is the one that's sure. more germane to our discussion here and then try to, if, if there's time left, to, to tie uh, what John just said um, to the insights of, of kind of the, the metaphysical realist tradition of, of Aristotle and St. Thomas. Um, so that's that's a weighty attempt to tie three things together. Um, we'll see how. <laughs> Don't worry, we, we've got a whole show to to, 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 to attempt to um, do that. So no, so so on. just very briefly. I mean, the book is written for my son. He's named Max, and it's that's after Saint Maximilian Kolbe, um, who was a Polish Franciscan friar, who was canonized as a saint in 1982 because of what he did as a prisoner at Auschwitz. Which, very briefly, um, someone from his prison block escaped, and the Nazis' usual method of responding to that was to choose 10 men randomly to die from the same prison block as collective punishment. And one of the men who was selected to die, uh, St. Maximilian wasn't, but one of the men who was selected said, my wife, my children, Maximilian Kolbe was so moved by this that he stepped forward from the line and uh, asked to take that man's place um, because he has a wife and children, as he said. So um, he, he died that way in a, in a starvation bunker um, and um, so I named my son after him because obviously I was very moved by the story and I felt like I had to do something with it. And luckily the Catholic Church has this system of uh, of naming children after saints in heaven who become patrons of your children. But um, my concern in writing the book was that our contemporary kind of liberal, technocratic, scientific, not, not scientific, but scientific worldview, if left to its own devices, will intellectually and spiritually malform my son. And so I wanted to inoculate him, as it were, against what that process might look like and to you know, open up a, a, a wider horizon than a worldview that says that, uh, you know, truth is only that can be, you can, um, you know, see with your, sense with your senses or observe with scientific instruments and generally um, articulate in using mathematical language and that there is this deeper account of truth um, encapsulated by the word tradition and um, crossing several cultural boundaries. Now, I'm very open that 
you know, I'm a Catholic and there, you know, in the Catholic Church, there's this idea of tradition with a capital T that it, you know, you, as a, as a Catholic, you adhere to and you accord greatest, greater deference to than other natural tradition. But if you believe that you, that, that God is a reasonable God and that he's, he's a God that is knowable by reason, there, then it follows that, um, this wisdom is sprinkled among the gentes, among the peoples, and that, um, uh, 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 uh there, there's lots that natural reason can attain to without the need for revelation, and that this whole tradition taken together can be a better guide to life than, again, a worldview that says that you're just a collection of, uh, you know, uh, uh, molecules and atoms and, and, and subatomic particles and um, uh, uh, you know, all of your moral intuitions and your moral is an ur urgent kind of interior life that's telling you, for example, that the life and sacrifice of a St. Maximilian Colby is valuable is nothing more, again, than the kind of firing of synapses in your brain and that there's no ultimate meaning to that because there's no truth to that. There is this tradition that counters that um, and that it's an, an intellectually serious one, um, especially uh, from my point of view, you know, discovering, really discovering Aristotle via St. Thomas Aquinas um, it gives a great, I don't want to say answer because that's too glib, but a way of addressing the tension that, that um, I think lies in what John said, and, and he's free to, I mean, I'd be, I'm open to correction on this, but that we live in the tension between either a kind of subjectivism or idealism that says that um, I can know only what's interior to me, and the world outside ultimately is unknowable. Um, this is kind of very anti-realist principle or a kind of materialism or oppressive objectivism that, that reduces that subjectivity that I experience as to, to one more kind of nearly material phenomenon. And so, you know, someone like, say, Thomas would say um, that the fact that those two interact and compenetrate each other, the fact that I, as a you know, as a kind of creature that has a brain that, yes, is all material and it's fleshy and so forth, but can nevertheless grasp abstract concepts. And by grasping in a way to become, you know, as, as, as my spiritual form is capable of becoming what I grasp mentally, suggests that there is this unity of being that compenetrates, so there's a suture between the subjective interior and the world outside. And that ultimately leads you to God and to ultimate reality. Um, and the, therefore, the order that you observe in the world really isn't random and, and meaningless. Um, so, but I, so, so much of what John said resonated with me. That is, he, I think he described our our predicament very acutely and, and astutely um, using kind of uh, the, the language of, of, of cognitive science. And I, I would argue that it's one that you know, the Western tradition has encountered and, you know, has been plunged into a crisis since, I would argue, since we abandoned metaphysical realism. What you see is really out there, first of all, and it tell, and the fact that the signals that it sends you of an orderly world aren't an illusion. They, the, the world is really orderly, and that says something, that kind of the chain of causation that you observe, the orderly chains of causation you observe in the world, suggest something about the world and its its ultimate offer well we'll we'll go to a quick break and i want to come back obviously to john to, to comment on some of what you've been saying there um we're talking about ancient wisdom and the meaning crisis on unbelievable today and my guests are Sorab amari and john verveki we'll be back shortly for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content sign up to the unbelievable newsletter Welcome back to the second part of this week's edition of Unbelievable. We're talking about ancient wisdom and the meaning crisis. Um, the, the meaning crisis in some ways is a, a phrase that was coined by John Viveki, one of my guests today, cognitive science and psychology professor at the University of Toronto. And his uh, lecture series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, is available at his YouTube channel. Very popular 
lecture series there uh, in conversation today with Sorab Amari uh, whose book The Unbroken Thread Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos was recently published and I think has a lot of interesting overlaps with John's work and that's why I wanted to bring you both together John and Sorab because obviously Sorab you, you are a Christian you're a Catholic um, John as I said not in a sense conventionally religious so I think you 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 would see a value in in uh in buddhism and so on um though whether that mm-hmm. counts as a you know s- typical religion it's it's not really a deistic religion um is is obviously something we could talk about but um just talk about you know the the the, the kind of angle at which um Sorab has been approaching this himself there john uh and the way he sees obviously this disconnect between um you know a scientific world that tells you you are basically just a, a you know a very cleverly arranged bunch of molecules but there's no ultimate meaning or purpose uh because obviously for for sorab this is quite significant to this meaning crisis is that something you see as as a significant part of this or is it different from where you are no i think it's it, it, it's a significant aspect of it that is um i i guess the and i, I mean that kind of worldview uh, appropriation or perhaps misappropriation is common common backing for the pervasive kind of nihilism and cynicism that's a background uh, attitude that people carry, not just an epistemic, a characterological attitude they carry towards other people in the world. Um, and so I think I think Sorab has put his finger on something that I would like to discuss uh, more at length, because um, I, I, I mean, Christian Platonism ha- has had a huge influence on my work. Um, and so uh, you know, uh, and and the way I think, um, uh, because uh, I, I I see myself very squarely in the Socratic Platonic uh, tradition. So maybe we'll meet somewhere in Plato between Socrates and Aristotle. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, um, what I want to say though, um, and so I, 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 that preamble was meant to say I'm not I'm not trying to in any way exclude the kind of argument that Sorab is making. I think it's an important argument. I take it seriously. I get into deep dialogue with people of the Christian tradition, because I take that argument seriously, Jonathan Pajot, Paul van der Klee, uh, J.P. Marceau. But I, part of what I've been trying to show is, um, uh, I think it's a converging argument in some ways, but I think it also challenges uh, the religious argument in some ways, and maybe we can play with that uh, together. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's been very much an argument emerging within 4E Cognitive Science that wants to undermine and seriously question that kind of reductionist approach uh, to ontology, and also takes very seriously, um, uh, I coined a term for the connection, the bonding connection between the subjective and the ab- uh, the objective, I call it the transjective, and that transjective relation as being a real relation and fundamental. It's kind of uh, a way of trying to go back to, you know, Gerson talks about ancient epistemology and how it's different from modern epistemology. Modern, modern epistemology starts inside and says, how is knowledge possible? Um, Ancient epistemology says, let's take it for granted that there must be knowledge or there's no point in the discussion. What does the, what does the world have to be like uh, such that knowledge is possible? What's the, what's the intelligibility and what's the ontology that grounds that intelligibility? And one of the ways of understanding what's been going on in 4E cognitive science, by the way, the E's mean embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted. Uh, if, to, if you'll allow me a bit of a slogan and don't jump too much on it, uh, what basically uh, 4E Cognitive Science says is, you know, the mind isn't in your head, it's between your full person and the world. That's where the mind is. The mind is uh, of, of basically more of a relate, and this is Aristotelian, it's more of a conformity theory of knowing rather than a representational theory of knowing. And so a lot of the presuppositions that are in the Cartesian framework that caused that deep cleft between the subjective and the objective, ideas about interior uh, representations, that knowledge is all propositional, that is all being very seriously challenged by cutting-edge cognitive science, the science that is trying to actually explain cognition and consciousness. So for example, I would say that I am not in any kind of minority when I reject the the label of materialism for the position. For one thing, uh, I, uh, and, and, and I'm not trying to cast dispersion on Sorab. Everybody uses this term, but nobody's really a materialist because people believe in things. First of all, we don't have the idea that mater- matter is just some inert 
piece of extension, a blob, right? Uh, we, we, that Descartes had, for example. Uh, we think of non-material things as, as real, like causal relations, space, time, uh, the relation, temporal relations, etc. Most of us, because we take biology seriously, as I do, um, uh, we take structural, functional organization uh, real. So what I'm saying here, uh, and we can maybe get into this at some point, is there is a, a very profound rejection of the nominalism that was center at the center. The the idea that there aren't real patterns in the world it, that the, you know it, you see it in Scotus and you see it in Occam. It's us that are making the path, and it, it it comes out in Romanticism that we express meaning onto the world, we press it onto the meal. So that whole nominalist, propositionalist, representationalist thing that tends to you know, really drive you into a materialist framework is being very undermined. Now, most people would therefore, even the, the hard-nosed ones would say they're physicalists, not materialists. Many of the physicalists would say we're non-reductive because, for example, I don't think the bottom level is the only real level and everything above it that emerges from it is somehow an illusion. Precisely because, I mean, I can make this argument more technical, but I'll leave it intuitive. Precisely mm. because it would make the level at which I do science and use measurements and use the information by which I determine the lower level an illusion. And then that makes no sense. How am I getting mm. from all of this illusion to this, to, to, to justify these claims about a fundamental reality? So I take a kind of real emergence, uh, uh, um, I take it. I take it for granted. Real patterns require real emergence, but it's not just emergence. And here's where John Scott Aragina and others have a deep influence on me. We have to understand that science has in its proper place in its ontology, not for causal events, but for the structuring of possibility and constraints. E equal m c squared is not an event. It is a real structuring. Notice the words I'm using of possibility. It says these things are possible. It rules out and rules in what can occur. So you have to think about possibility. And this is a big thing in 4E cognitive science, being a, a, a real source of constraint. So you have bottom up causal emergence and you have top down real constraint. So you have, if you'll allow me the ancient language, you have emergence and emanation and they're completely interdependent and interdefining. And so for most people, they would say, we're, we're, I would call myself a naturalist because I sit there, which means I don't, I, I think that I'm not only committed to the entities derivable from science, I'm committed to the entities presupposed by science in my ontology. I ha my ontology has to go up into what is presupposed in the intelligibility of the universe. And it also has to reach down to the fundamentals from which things emerge and trying to understand how that works in a phenomena in like in phenomena like life and cognition is, is an exciting and enriching task and so uh, again uh, I, I mean there's still significant differences between my position and Sarah, but i'm trying to i'm trying to i don't know if, if this is the right way because you're, I you're trying to create we're, a, we're, a bridge here i feel that there is there is a yes sort of, yes uh, a point that, which yes, there's, yes. There's, there's, there's a kind of sub, sub so a way in which you're reaching over to his position and you, I, I, you, yes, I, you are a naturalist. I feel the in, bridge, in the, especially go ahead, John, des John described where cognitive science is as to what the perceiving thinking self is. As he put it, it, it is in the interrelation between the kind of interior subjective and the objective kind of uh, phenomena in the world that that is deeply, I mean, Aristotelian, I, 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 I can't put it in any other way. Um, I don't know if he'd accept that characterization, but um, it, all I was saying is basically, I, I did not take that at all to be a critique. It was, it, and nor a kind of glib validation, but that there is that there is a bridge. For me, I, I, I would call it, I, I would call, uh, yeah, i call it uh, Aristotelian, although I, uh, um, I, I see myself more as a Neoplatonist. I mean, Aristotle, I mean, uh, sorry, Aquinas is, is deeply influenced also by the Neoplatonic tradition. Dionysus is a huge influence, almost as big as Aristotle on Aquinas. And many people, Gerson and others have, you know, and Pearl have noted how Neoplatonic um, um, uh, 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 Aquinas is. Um, and, and, you know, and John Scotus and Dionysus are properly Neoplatonic. So, and it's like, why are you invoking this ancient wisdom? Uh, 
quick allusion mm. to the title of the show. Um, I'm, I'm doing that because that Neoplatonic framework is coming back to the fore as a way, I would argue, I'm not, I, I mean, here's where I think I am more of a, everything I said before is, I think, well describing a lot of for cognitive science. I tend to think, um, and I'm making, a, I'm trying to make a case for it, that that Neoplatonic framework can be, you know, it can be reformulated in a way that um, can ontologically ground and valorize uh, the kind of stuff that I'm talking about in 4 cognitive science. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this, though, Rab. And, and for the for those of us who aren't so familiar with terms like neoplatonic or ontologies and that kind of thing, just 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 explain for us, Sora, where you see this connection for, if you like, you know, when it comes to some of the stuff you've been writing about with the ancient wisdom and the way we need to grasp onto this. Obviously, you you do cover, you know, Plato and and uh, and so on in the book. So so to maybe if you want to start there and and make the connections here with what John's saying. I, I'm I'm specific. I have my, my specific commitments are to um, uh, the rediscovery of Aristotle via St. Thomas Aquinas, and then more recently in the kind of um, uh, uh, neo-scholastic thinkers of, of the first half of the 20th century. And um, again, as speaking as a late, I'm, I'm a journalist, I'm not a, I'm, not a, I'm neither a, a, an empirical scientist nor a, nor a philosopher. I, I've found in the kind of Aristotelian Thomistic synthesis, the best kind of most cogent account um, that could reconcile um, either a kind of pure subjectivism um, that draws you inward and an endless kind of uh, solipsistic search inside the self for what the truth is, and a kind of cold uh, naturalism, materialism, you want to call it, that observes phenomenon like the human, the moral conscience, or um, would it, would it, uh, strikes the ordinary person as his soul, as his, and just says that's nothing mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, whatever the, uh, uh, whatever kind of material thing you want to, you want to reduce those two things to, the conscience and the soul, um, where you say, well, no, if, if a being is in part, if, if a human being is in part capable of grasping abstractions, that suggests that there is, um, um, in the world, that there is a, there's a structure to the world itself, uh, a reasonable structure that somehow in the act of both perception or in making judgments, which is a little more con- complex, um, something like Compenetration, or a, a, what neo scholastics I was like Sir Delange called a suture happens between that outside world and you yourself, and that ultimately is only for someone like Sir Delange, who is a, a, a 20th century um, Aristotelian Thomas, is only ultimately explainable by the fact that um, that there is a God, um, and so therefore that that. Um, a god who is a reasonable god and, that, and, a, and an orderly world, and so that the, you know your uh, making judgments or perceiving things is your participation in this orderly world. Um, I I just find that very satisfying, um, but um, yeah, I'll stop there. I find that as, as opposed to, as opposed to as opposed to conceding at the, you know, as either the kind of extremes of idealism or materialism. Sure. I mean, John, I mean, your your concern is not so much with whether God exists or not, as far as I can see. You, you, you have a practical concern about how we make meaning in the world, whether we can kind of get back to that place, perhaps, that we lost of, of finding, you know, a sense of, of purpose and reality um to what extent do you see sort of religion as having lost its ability to do that for people today and um, what what do you make of someone like Sorab who obviously feels that his conversion to Catholicism did put the pieces together in a way that that makes sense for, for him that's a that's a good question it's a complex question I I, I... I want to challenge the first thing you said I, I, I it is not mm. the case that I'm not interested in the question of God 
Um, that that is not okay. true of me. I was actually raised a Christian. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was raised in a, a, a fundamentalist version of Christian that was quite traumatic for me. Uh, but um, um, I, I, through a lot of help and a lot of work over a couple decades, uh, and also with some convergence of the stuff I've been talking about, I've come back to uh, a, a, a deep appreciation of it. Um, I think Christian Platonism is, you know, uh, the 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 the, uh, the spiritual backbone of whatever the West, whatever the word the West means. But I think there's mm. versions uh, analogous to it. I think there's uh, an Islamic Platonism within Sufism that I think is also uh, uh, also worthy. Uh, 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 of affording a good life. I think there is a Platonic uh, Judaism in Kabbalah, some of the work I've done with uh, Zevi Slavin um, and, 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 and various other things. So um, uh, I, I guess I cast my net a little bit more broadly. I, I don't, I'm not trying to say that makes my position better. I'm just trying to explain where I'm coming from. Mm. So this is why I'm interested in the question of God. Um, um, if, it, of course, I'm going to do this, the, the, the move that everybody does at the party. Well, it all depends on what you mean by God. Uh, and, but <laughs> yes. I, I'm trying to, I want to say that more, more profoundly. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I read a lot of theological work uh, and philosophical uh, and philosophy of religion. Here's why. Because at the core of, I think, rationality, I think part of what we've done in the meaning crisis, right, is we've reduced rationality to logicality. Uh, the logical ordering of our propositions, and that's not what—that's not the profound, deep meaning of rationality. That truncation of rationality has cost us deeply. It has cut us off from all the other ways of knowing, uh, other than the propositional knowing, that are the are are the are the locus of where the meaning making, where the relevance realization is happening. And so, I would uh, if we if we if we open up uh, the notion of rationality so it could be properly reconnected to wisdom and think about it as, you know, a process of systemic and systematic self-correction, that the, the rational person is somebody who systematically and systemically tries to correct for self-deception within their cognition. As soon as you do that, you're committed to two things. You're committed to there being an intelligibility in the world that can act as a source, a normative source on you for correction. There is a way things are. There, error and failure and falsity have to be really possible. All right. And the other thing is self-correction and self-transcendence are two sides of the same coin. If you're invoking within rationality self-correction, you are presupposing a capacity for significant self-transcendence. So if you and then so what you what you start to think about is the possibility that human beings can engage in acts of self-transcendence that take them deeper, they're less blinded, deeper into the structures of the intelligibility of the world, and thereby their sense of connectedness to reality and to themselves and to others. That, those are the three dimensions of meaning in life, are enhanced. I think when that's happening, people start to talk about the meaning as being sacred. There's, if we think of sacredness as an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility, where I mean this kind of profound connectedness to reality, and that there's something in reality that affords that ongoing self-transcendence, and that we experience as a profound kind of sacredness, in that sense... I am interested in the question of God. And so I'm interested in, right, what people, how people have tried. Uh, but I'm also interested in the Tao. I'm also interested in Shunyata. And, and I'm not just mm. being sort of, you know, a, a simple li liberal or something like that. I, I, what I mean is I take seriously longstanding traditions with deep philosophical work that are trying to give us a living and, and, and growing formulation of that sacredness so yeah. that it affords people real self-transcendence that's what that's that's what i'm interested in and and it, it strikes me that Saurabh, you 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 do that as well in your book that that you aren't simply limiting yourself just to christian examples no no, no. i mean I mean, the book uh, is is to a fault ecumenical i mean you know we range through uh pagan thinkers like seneca or Confucius, we kind of mm. completely outside the Western matrix. Um, uh, the modern philosopher Hans Jonas, is kind of Aristotelian, but a um, critic of Gnosticism. Um, but from you know, he himself was an agnostic. But of course, also the kind of 
the classic figures like like Thomas Aquinas and, and Augustine make an appearance. But a, a number of things struck me. One is how much John and I John and I agree on the way he put it, the way he described it as a kind of narrowing of what what rationality is that excludes um, uh, contemplative life as such, um, or much of contemplative life. Um, you know. That's very much in a, a vein of uh, the, the Regensburg address, uh, Pope Benedict's address, which was misperceived as a kind of harangue against Islam, which it really wasn't. I mean, he was critical of Islam in some ways, but but it was it was more so a an, a critique of which he, by the way, blamed on John John Don Scotus, um, uh, the, the the ever narrowing um, pinched version of what really reason is, and everything else is. is he, he traced back to Scotus. Um, the, and the use of the phrase, one way of knowing, um, it appears in my book where I say, you know, we, we privilege one way of knowing over others that um, are, are, are no less reasonable for not being necessarily um, uh, empirical, even if they might spark with it, uh, an empirical substrate. Mm. They go beyond it, but that doesn't make them uh, unreasonable. Um, so those are those are all points of points of agreement, and then to the point that yeah. J- John made, where he said, um, you know, uh, I'm interested in God as this principle of intelligibility in the world that is reflected in various traditions. That also, I think, is very much um, it very much coheres with with this idea of of natural theology, which is um, you with natural theology you, you don't. Um, you basically begin with with um, uh, uh, you know the, the you begin with this kind of demonstration of the necessity of something, not its not its nature, and that's how that's how natural theology defines God because um, uh, you you can't begin with any categories that are anterior to God. Right. If you're just dealing with natural reason, you can't. You, your demonstration can't be given with anything that's previous to God because He's God. So, what can you do with natural theology? You have to. You have to demonstrate um, just the function that He fulfills in the world. And um, again, if you're just relying on, on natural reason, and that would mean, you know, uh, uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, all the kind of classical proofs. Um, uh, are a way in which people across traditions, I would argue, can reason about God. And the, the fact that we can do that suggests that, that what people call God, call God is a reasonable God because he's made himself known to this kind of, uh, of reasoning. So there's, there's nothing wrong with, I think, saying um, God is the, you know, is the principle of intelligibility in the world. And various peoples have accessed them in different ways. Um, I mean, in other words, I, I would not object to, to thinking about God that way, as as an invitation to natural theology. Yeah, I, I mean, just before we come back to you, John, I mean, just just elucidate a little bit how that applies to ancient wisdom, because at one level, so uh, um, you know, simply getting people to believe in God may just be yet another little bit of propositional knowledge that you're you're giving someone i think that the the transformation happens in in obviously the way that works out in someone's life and the difference that makes and and that for you is is where presumably the 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 practice of living by a a rule of life and uh, a a way of you know the ancient wisdom that you uh, you know put put out in the book that is this is this for you sorab a a way to push back against this meaning crisis is that where we have to go in order to to sort of see people connect again with purpose intrinsic dignity reality you know is is that what you would recommend not just to believe in god but to to experience god through through a, tradition. Through a religious community sure. yeah yeah i mean the way i i i describe it as a as a great um a great relaxation actually in the sense that um um to live in accord with tradition broadly understood, and you can divide the, the best definition of tradition I've encountered is two is uh, is only two words, but it, it conveys a lot. It's is as ordered continuity. If you have a sense that there is a 
Um, there are a set of steps or a road stretching behind you and that therefore follow ahead of you. And um, you're still free. You have, you have free choice as a human being. You're still rational, but that um, you will find your fulfillment, what it means to be fully human, what it means to be, um, what it means to be happy in following the path in the way that your forebears have in some ways and in the way that it stretches behind you. You, first of all, relax and so you're not constantly searching inside yourself for meaning, which is something I did for much of my 20s. It's not atypical. I think lots of 20-somethings do it, and maybe it's a kind of universal rump spring that we all have to go through. But then at some point, if you then trust um, the democracy, um, the idea of democracy extended to, to the ancients and giving them a voice, which Chesterton defined as it, that was Chester's definition of tradition is, is democracy and extended to our ancestors. Um, you relax, you see that there is a way that has worked out for generations prior and um, it can be reasoned about. Uh, uh, kind of in, truly enduring traditions are open to being reasoned about, Islam, Catholicism, what have you. Um, but ultimately there is, there is a way and you don't, um, and I also think it, it allows you to leap into the future, I think, more fearlessly. And I, what I see among my my peers, and I'm not talking about people who live in the, the absolute precariat, you know, working class people ravaged in the United States by, you know, opioids and porn addiction, but even a young elites, if they don't make decisions. They don't actually exercise their free will they, because they're so committed to keeping, quote unquote, their options open. They don't commit to one thing decisively ever. And I think that lack of courage comes from not having, you know, stable meaning. A stable horizon of meaning allows you to kind of leap into the future um, instead of just kind of traveling endlessly on the world, posting Instagram posts or what have you. You, you know, you know what it is to be a man, what it means to be a father, what it means to be a mother, what it mm. means to be a wife. And you sort of really embrace what you ought to do. That's what traditions allow us to do, I think. The great traditions that have been doing. We'll come back to that um, with John Verveke, my other guest on the show today, in conversation with Sorab Amari. Uh, we're talking about ancient wisdom and the meaning crisis. And, uh, well, the hour has flown by and we've, we've just got another 10 or 15 minutes on the other side of a break, but we'll do what we can with it, John and Sorab. So do join us again in just a moment's time for more on this fascinating subject. In the United Kingdom just today, we passed 100,000 people who've been killed by the virus. I'm not the one here who is claiming that this is being supervised, that somebody is watching this, somebody knows that this is occurring, and somebody's allowing it to occur. We're in no position to say definitively there is no morally justifiable reason for this particular evil, because we need a godlike perspective on all of space and all of time in order to make that claim. We've been talking about ancient wisdom and the meaning crisis. My guests are John Verveke and Sorab Amari. John Verveke um, has a, a great popular lecture series on YouTube called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and uh, was recently in conversation on these sorts of issues with Jordan Peterson as well. I'll make sure there are links to where you can find out more about John and also my other guest Sorab Amari, um, whose book The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos, has been widely lauded by people, all of whom are recent guests on Unbelievable, like Douglas Murray, uh, Giles Fraser and Tom Holland. Um, so, um, John, just in that last section, you know, Sorab was coming to the to the core of his book, really, th this idea that it is in embracing a tradition, a, a pattern of life, if you like, understanding that you are made to be someone specific um, that, that kind of allows people the freedom to, to, to then live a meaningful life life and i got the sense and sorry i didn't explicitly say this but but that 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 goes against the grain of what is often a very postmodern culture in which i can make my own narrative but in which everyone never really knows what their story is supposed to be because there are so many options on the table and we're all supposed to reinvent ourselves constantly i mean do you see that danger john is that is that part of the problem as far as you're concerned when it comes to the the effects of this meaning crisis um I mean, there's danger. I mean, I think there's great value in the postmodern critique. Uh, I think people need to read it more carefully. 
Um, I think there's, I think there are uh, rational responses uh, to like the Derrida, Foucault. Those are the two postmodernists I know uh, sort of the most about. I um, mean, because postmodernism, properly understood, is a profound critique of modernity, the kind of worldview that was given to us by the Enlightenment, and I think that critique should be. Uh, taken seriously. And I would also criticize the invocation of postmodern thought rather than the actual study of it, which is pervasive right now in this culture. Um, uh, uh, you know, there's, you, you see, for example, Derrida towards the end of his career becoming very interested in um, the Neoplatonic mysticism, uh, the, the kind, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 ineffable, inexpressible, and and um, things like that. So, I, I guess I don't want to villainize uh, the postmodernists. Sure. Uh, I, I push back against that. I think they should be brought to the table, uh, <clears throat> and I think we should. Uh, and, and I I understand why they're invoked because they're seen as the de the deconstruction, to use Derrida's term, of the tradition. And um, part of my concern, I guess. Sorry, I just want to say. I also, in my book, I never take aim at uh, postmodernists. I think some of the promotional copy for my book says, like, the postmodernists. But actually, I, yeah. I, I, the, the people I take issue with are not like Foucault, <laughs> Derrida. Yeah. I go back about 400 years. Oh, I, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, and uh, I, think the, I think the turn happens with with Occam uh, and, and with, uh, with with Scotus, but uh, I didn't mean to misattribute anything to you. I apologize if I did. It's the topic was introduced by Justin, and that's why it I was. It was. I was. I was uh, at fault for, for for introducing the term postmodern, and probably that wasn't the most helpful one at this moment. But but I suppose I'm I'm really interested in that in that thought of the the, the wisdom tradition and the way that Sorab obviously feels it it rather than being a straitjacket, it frees people, and I think very often it's usually seen the opposite way around it's a sort of it's narrow if you're in a tradition and we're supposed to be, live life where we keep our options open and we can be who we want to be and, and everything else well, well let me say something that is in support of that uh and then say something that's a, a, perhaps a criticism of it uh one of my uh, ras um jensen kim kim jensen kim has done work showing and so we now i mean i'm also part of uh, an ongoing group of people that we, we do the scientific investigation of wisdom as a phenomena, as a cognitive phenomena. We just published, I was one of the authors, the lead author was Igor Grossman in Psycho uh, um, Psychological Inquiry, High Impact Journal, a consensus paper. We got most of the main players and a growing consensus about what we mean and how we can measure it. Now, that doesn't mean we're done or anything ridiculous like that. Anybody who claims that about a scientific endeavor is lying to you. Uh, but... Right. What I'm saying is there, there's, a, there's a study going on there, and Jun Sung is properly part of that, and he's done work showing that people within a particular religious tradition tend to do better at sc uh, scores of, uh, of wisdom than people outside of a tradition. And this makes all kinds of good sense given the nature of distributed cognition, um, and, the, and we're discovering that most of our cognition is done. I, I often use this. Uh, way before the internet networked computers together to release the power of distributed computation, culture networked human minds together to release the power of distributed cognition. And distributed cognition is a very, like, other than our bodies and our language, everything around us is being managed by distributed cognition, right? Um, and so it makes good sense that people within a tradition do better at cultivating wisdom than people outside of a tradition. That's evidence, I think, good empirical evidence supporting Sorab's work. Interestingly enough, no significant measurable difference between the traditions, an Islamic, a Buddhist, a Christian, right? So that part, right? And so what does that lead me? That doesn't get to the salvation issue. I'm to, kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, well, that, yeah. Well, so, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, that, that's it. That's, that's the thing, right? And, and, no, no, no. It's no. I, I, well, I, 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 I get the, I, I get the good spirit uh, of the joke, but I think there's a legitimate point in there, which is, if that is good reason to believe that the significant factors, and this goes with uh, an argument we've been uh, sort of exploring here, that the significant factors contributing are not the propositional factors, are not the propositional right. Uh, now that doesn't mean you can have just a freewheeling no ontology. I've already made an argument about, you, you know, there has to be a presupposition of intelligibility, etc. But 
what it tends to indicate is that um, the commitment we have, I mean, part of what we got from modernity was the idea that our beliefs in, in terms of the propositions we assert are the core of, for example, our spirituality. We, we've reduced, we, people talk, use the word faith and belief interchangeably. I think that is a grotesque mistake because I think, and that's what I think is being revealed in that, that data I just, I just mentioned. So I talk about other kinds of knowing other than the propositional, procedural, perspectival, participatory. And like I said, those are the ones, and they have different standards by which we assess reality. Our skills are not true or false. They're powerful or not. Our, our states of mind, our perspectives aren't true or false. They give us a sense of presence or not. And our, our participatory knowing isn't true or false. It's whether or not we feel at one with reality or not. And those those are very different standards of realness. And reducing everything to the conviction of my belief in a proposition, I think is part of the meaning crisis. So while I support tradition in one sense, I don't, I think there's a way in which a lot, uh, a lot of, I don't know what to, I, uh, you'll allow me, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense. I'm not a new atheist. A lot of, of a lot of religion is deeply infected with that kind of modern, like the the the, the enlightenment epistemology, the enlightenment ontology, the enlightenment metaphysics, and it is too much committed to a creedal aspect. And so I'm very interested in the what are called the nuns, the n o n e s s, the people that have no uh, specific religious allegiance. Now, if you look at them, they're they're not. The, the vast majority of them are not new atheists or anything like that. The, 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 the most common way they describe themselves is spiritual, but not religious, which has become, again, this, this almost useless self-designation, which is a way of saying, I think, incohately, I'm interested in meaning, I'm interested in connection, I'm interested in wisdom. And, what I'm, what, and, and you also look at why they reject the established religions. It's not primarily because of thought out, you know, atheistic arguments and here's Epicurus's refutation and Hume's. It's, it's, that's not it. They don't find these religions viable. They don't mm. find them viable. So it's an issue not of truth, if you'll allow me to go back to something earlier. It's an issue of relevance. And there's too much hammering on this is, has to be taken as true. And what I think is what we should be recommending to people, and I'm interested in the nuns, is how can people fall in love with reality again? How can they fall in love with reality again? And, and to understand the connection, understand it more as faithfulness than faith, the way I'm faithful to my partner, doesn't mean that I have a set of permanent propositions that I believe about her. In fact, if I'm into that place, my relationship is pretty much doomed. Instead, what it means is, as she changes, I maintain a continuity of contact and I maintain a place within me where she can, when she needs to transcend herself, and she affords that in me, and we continually reciprocally open to each other. I want people to reciprocally open to reality, to fall in love with reality again. And I think the emphasis on, on assertion of propositions and the conviction of truth at the expense of all these other more primary ways in which we love reality. And this is the, this is the key platonic insight. We ultimately love reality. I do this in my classroom. I'll say, put up your hands if you're in a really satisfying romantic relationship. You know, a certain number of students put up my hand. They say, keep your hands up if you would want to know if your partner was cheating on you, and that would mean the absolute destruction of the relationship. 95% of the people keep their hands up. And when I ask them why, all these people that are supposed to be cynical and, you know, postmodern, they say, because it wouldn't be real then. <laughs> it wouldn't be real. Mm. Plato mm. was right. In addition to whatever we desire, we have a meta desire that the thing that the object that satisfies our desire is real. We need to get mm. people to fall in love with reality again. And I okay. I think there that that means that means that means something. I, I've shown you, sort of. I'm very respectful of tradition, but that means also turning to what's on offer right now from the cognitive science, from the philosophy of biology, that could help enhance our capacity to meet people and restore that kind of sense of relevance. So that's perhaps where I differ. Yeah. So, Rob. Well, very briefly, I, I mean. I, 
First of all, I, I have to defend the idea of dogma as, um, as, as a kind of, the kind of presupposition that for ordinary people makes, uh, maintain the intelligibility of reality without the need for, uh, you know, constant uh, Aristotelian proofs, right? Like it, God, you know, who created the world? God. Why did He create you? Because you know, to, so that I can know and love Him. That I'm, I'm badly restaging the Baltimore Catechism, but um, for for ordinary people, um, you know, who, most of them, you know, aren't philosophers, or you know, they're they're not avarice or whatever. That 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 dogma actually helps keep reality um, imbued with magic, <laughs> and so. Uh, it's worthwhile for that reason, but uh, on the whole, though, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that um, religion's central task in the 21st century is to deal with precisely not the not the new atheists, but precisely with people who, which is about 20, 25 percent of Americans now who identify as as spiritual but not religious. I have a chapter in my book. Um, centered around Victor and Edith Turner. They were, I, I won't go into the details, but very briefly, they were a pair of British anthropologists. They were like post-war communists, mm -hmm. but they went to observe uh, Central Central African religion and the process of watching what it was that religious ritual did for, in a tribal African society, convinced them that they themselves needed to become religious uh, in their own lives. Um, and they're really kind of... A, Foundations of, 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 of anthropology of religion are really laid down by uh, by the Turners, but um, um, so the the argument of the chapter is that that spirituality unmediated by by cults by religion is actually pretty weak sauce. That that, that it's precisely our um, something about rituals handed down the generations that and that embody. Uh, ultimate accounts of, accounts of meaning that no one person could invent. And the acts of embodiment themselves could not be easily invented by individuals. Um, therefore, you can't just say, I'm just going to do 30 minutes of yoga and 30 minutes of, you know, spinning and just drink, you know, juice on Fridays instead of meat and call that a religion. Like you they call that spirituality. Because it fails at spirituality, it doesn't satisfy a lot of things that happen in re in, in religious ritual that uh, don't happen in kind of privatized, individualized uh, uh, spirituality. Nevertheless, I, I would just end it there. That I, I agree with you that that is the great challenge, though. It's it's you're right. It's a, one more proof for the existence of God. You know, the classical proofs will not sway a lot of these people. Um, it's it's that question of relevance. You're exactly right. That will make or break religion in the 21st century. So, to what extent, John, as we draw this to a close, do you do you wish to see the revival of religion? You know, we are living in an increasingly post-religious West. Um, the rise of the nuns and everything else. Um, but it doesn't sound like you want a sort of a dogmatic form, return of a dogmatic form of religion. But you, nonetheless, you see the value that obviously the tradition has and and that there's something there now can can a kind of cognitive psychological approach sort of do the job of of replacing that you know if we just get people into you know whatever the the current the current way of embodying those traditions um in a sort of more secular sphere would be or do we need some a return to the more full-blooded you know roman catholicism that that sorab obviously inhabits and has found so helpful um, what, what's your feeling, John? Well, first of all, I don't want to in any way besmirch people who return to the existing world religions and find a genuine path to the cultivation of wisdom, self-transcendence, uh, uh, virtue. I, like, uh, right? um, I think, uh, I guess, I talk about what I call a religion that's not a religion in, in that I want to put the religio uh, back center stage over the credo and i think there's a lot that we need to think about uh drawing into an ecology of practices uh so, so i mentioned victor turner victor turner talked about the flow state within ritual 
Chikset Mahai has done uh, work on flow. I've published on the nature of flow. What are the cognitive processes at work in flow? How can we best induce flow? Uh, and and then what does that what does that link to that we need to think about? You know what the most powerful flow induction machinery right at around right now are are things like video games, but they tend to they tend to lock people in. What about that medium and its ritual use? and its connection to a scientific understanding of flow. How is that going to be properly incorporated into both an individual, and I, I really think distributed cognition is important, and a, and, and, and a shared community. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. And, and so, and I'm only using that as one quick example of, no, no, and, right? And we have, if we think we're going to get people to just give up the hyper acceleration of cyber technology that's happening right now, that's not going to happen. And that's one of the most primary reasons why many people are not interested. There's other reasons. That's one, right? Why they're not interested in the traditional religions, because this huge aspect of their life that consumes them and in which they do most of their seeking for meaning is not talked about, is not addressed, is not being exapted, drawn into the ritual life of any particular uh, you know, spiritual or religious community. And I, 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 I'm not hanging my argument on that whole thing. That is just one example of many examples I can give of the kind of... No, I get yeah. it. I get it. I get mm. what you're saying. Yeah, so, Rob, so, any, any response um, to that? No, no, other than that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great challenge for, you know, the church. I'll be honest. I mean, I, it's a great challenge. I mean, when I say the church, I mean specifically the Roman church. Um, and... Um, uh, essentially, what the problems that John has outlined are um, problems for you, people like you and me, Justin, who are Christian believers. You know, and how do we how do we take that into account? The fact that um, and one response is that some of this stuff is purely. I mean, it's I don't know. It's my base response, but it, it's horrible and destructive and waste time. I mean, I, why are people playing video games? Um, but I know the millions do, and so that's not a that's not a sufficient response. But um, um, it, it yeah. strikes me as gnostic and weird. And you know, I played video games when I was twelve, and then I grew up. And but that's not what you can say to people. And so yeah, that, that, there's clearly a, a, a need that's not answered by traditional religion that is answered by these kind of media. Well, well exactly. Now, I was going to say that the problem can be sometimes with the religious mindset is that it simply is a kind of tells people off for not engaging in the you know higher things and so on and i will say that i'm very i have a very good twitter meme game you know so like i, <laughs> I, I you know i'm in it i i try i try but uh no i think john has set forth a really important but, question and a challenge to, yeah to religion yeah. In 21st i mean why you know churches are competing with technology you know with with the addiction that that technology brings and there's a good reason why people have are finding their meaning in that space um you know mm -hmm. and and not in you know the traditional spaces and and that is a great challenge as you say so rab to to what the church does in that in that um i hope that we in a way have an ally with you john i feel we do even though obviously we don't share all the same metaphysical commitments but uh, it's been it's been a very interesting and challenging uh deep dive into this area um i will encourage anyone who's watching we've really just scratched the surface both of john's work and indeed the book by sorab as well um the unbroken thread and i'll make sure there are links to both john and sorab from today's show but it's been it's been a real pleasure to to bring you both together i always i so enjoy bringing just interesting people together who haven't met each other yet and seeing what happens and, and this was a great example of that so so john and so rab thank you so much for being my guests on unbelievable today thank you justin and john uh, thank you justin and, and a great pleasure getting to talk with you so rab. likewise great pleasure I enjoyed that so much for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.